Greetings all and welcome back to the channel. Today is finally the day. We're finally going to get the RSB 755 to a fully working order. Finally, at long last. It's working fairly well as it is now, but uh, you might recall that the uh, the idler gear or the idler drive gear that's attached to this motor back here is cracked and needs to be replaced. Well, it's been three months since I ordered that gear from one source, and it never came. I got in contact with the seller again who sent another shipment, but that shipment has not come yet. I'm not sure if it ever will, but uh, thankfully I was a little smart about it this time, and I ordered from another source. So hopefully I've got something that'll work now. I decided it was important to avoid the use of uh, 3D printed gears on that particular application because I'm not sure a 3D printed gear will hold up to that so uh, I had to go to the injection molded sources which are all in Europe I guess possibly not I don't know anyway I've got a gear and it's going in and I'm gonna try to get the wow and flutter as low as possible on this thing it's already really low this is the best performing cassette deck I have for wow and flutter but uh yeah, if it's going to make test tapes, it's got to be as low as possible. Even though I now have, oh, what is it now? I'm up to three top-of-the-line cassette decks being imported from Japan right now, two of which are Quartz Lock Direct Drive. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to see whether or not this can do the job. If not, I'm going to make it a nice-sounding cassette deck anyway, just because I can. Hopefully I can. Anyway, before I get to the uh, transport service part of this video, which will probably take a lot of time, I've got to address all this stuff in here first, because uh, I'm doing the ANT or Alex Nitkin mods to this unit. Because I might as well. Now I'll go over those modifications and what they entail in a little bit here, but I kind of want to get started and get them all done first. So that's what I'm going to do momentarily. Now, I was going to go above and beyond the Alex Ditkin mods, or ANT mods, or whatever you call them. I was going to recap the entire signal chain of this tape deck with Nichicon Muse. And then I realized something. This thing already has audio-grade capacitors in it. Let me show you here. Like this one right here. That one. That's a Panasonic Purism capacitor. And this deck is loaded with those things. So uh, I'm going to give those capacitors a chance first before I go in and here and replace capacitors. I'm just going to, I want to hear how they sound first is all. With that said, I am going to recap the power supply. I don't know exactly what uh, product range they used for these, but I am replacing them. And these three up here are going to be replaced with uh, Panasonic... Oh, what was the name of it now? I can't think. Panasonic FR is what's going in here. And uh, I'll be doing the entire power supply, like I mentioned. But uh, you may recall that I kind of ranted a bit on these capacitors in the uh, Technics RSM245X. Saying that they were junk. Well, they were in that unit... But uh, this one dates from 1990, and they and by that time, they had all the bugs worked out of these capacitors. So these are probably good. Very likely good, they're good. But uh, like I said, I'm getting in here. I'm doing all these modifications. I might as well do the power supply as well while I'm in here. And I've heard real good things about Panasonic FR when it comes to these capacitors. So very high lifespan capacitors very good at ripple control so we're gonna try those and see how it works out but uh yeah one thing i will mention before i get to these mods is uh this chip here is part of it but uh, this is an eight pin chip and my replacement is a nine pin it's the same nine pin chip i used in the uh carver td 1700 but it will work in here. I have verified this with the data sheets. And uh, 
Basically, all you have to do is uh, take pin 1 out of the equation on the 9-pin one. So pins 8 to pin 2 will be used. Basically, pin 8 and pin 1 on the... Er, I don't know what I'm talking about. Basically, pins 9 and 1 on the new chip do the same thing. They're the voltage supply to the chip. So, uh, basically, 8 of the 9 pins are pin compatible with the 9 pins. So I'm just going to chop off the one I don't use. That's basically how I'm dealing with that. So just an update before I keep going with these modifications. I got the power supply recap finished, but uh, predictably I screwed up in the order again. See, the the FRs I ordered, the 2200s, predictably I got the wrong voltage value again. The ones I ordered were 16 volts and the ones that were in here were 25 volts. Now the schematic suggested that shouldn't be a problem, but just in case, I decided to go ahead and pull the trigger on putting in 3300s instead of the 2200s. These are the right uh, voltage, so uh, they'll probably work fine. It's just power supply uh, filtering they're doing, so the increase in capacity shouldn't be a problem for there. But uh, because all three of these were earmarked for other tape decks, I've got to order new parts again. So, yeah, that's on me. I'll do whatever I have to. Anyhow, those are the only three FRs. The rest of this has been done using uh, Rubicon and Chemicon. This one over here is a KZE. That's not really a capacitor for the power supply. It's for the control. But uh, I did it anyway just because I could. This one is Rubicon. These two are Rubicon. These four are Rubicon. And this one is Nichicon PY. So yeah, that should be set to go now. And I found an issue while I was under there. You see this discolored spot under this transistor? Well, I found bad, or, bad solder joints under there. Not bad or solder, solder joints. I've got fish and chips on the brain or something. I don't know. Anyhow, it, this apparently has been getting hot for a while now, so I retouched those joints, and hopefully that transistor it has a nice long life now. But, uh, yeah, whatever. So, I'm about to get around to uh, doing these modifications over here. IC3 is getting replaced, and of course we talked about this one, so... IC3 is not getting replaced with another IC. It's going in with a uh, relay. So I was going to do this back at the deck, but then I figured maybe I should probably do this with the actual PDF in front of me and where you guys could see so I could detail all these modifications and what I did to that RSB755 just now. And as it would turn out, the 765, which is basically similar in, the, in terms of the modifications, it's basically the same circuit layout for for the most part. Anyway, before I start rambling too much, I just wanted to mention, I think I mispronounced his name earlier, but uh, I believe Alex's name is Alex Nicotin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or, or whatever, but uh, my apologies if I got your name wrong. People get my name wrong all the time and it pisses me off, so I figured I'd mention that. Anyhow, let's get into these mods and I'll tell you exactly what I did to this unit. So we'll go through the service manual here. And uh, this is why I love this company. Look at all the information you've got in here. Just everything is here. And also I want to mention or give a thanks to user Perfecious from Tapeheads for putting this uh, PDF together for easy reference as to uh, what the uh, mods are and where they go and what they do. So... Well, not so much what they do, but where they go. Okay, here are the mods here, starting from here. All right, R17 and R18. These two did not get applied because I did not change the head over. For changing the head to amorphous head, you would need to change these two resistors. I have not done that, so I didn't. Okay, these are the part of the recording amp mods. You change R23 and 24 for, to uh, 3.3K, original being 6.8K. And uh, I got to tell you, I didn't order these from DigiKey. Somehow I missed them. 
And uh, yeah, I had to go back into my old stockpile and see what I had. And fortunately, I did have those, but I had those in half watt. The originals are quarter watts, so uh, they're real obvious when you look at the board. But uh, they work, so we'll leave them alone. Okay, we've got some more mods up here. This is for the amorphous head again. you got to change those two capacitors. See, 21 and 22. And you can see right there which, uh, which head they're talking about. The Canon CB3601. I'm not going to bother with that for this deck. I'm not going to put that much money into it. Anyhow, down here, we have two more mods. This is the HX Pro mod for more extension. And you just simply add 470k ohm resistors to certain points on the board. And I've added those underneath the board, so you can't really see them, but uh, they are there. But yeah, there's another recording mod here for the amorphous head that you have to do. I didn't bother again, so no point me going over those. Okay, let's scroll down here. Got some more mods here. This one has been done, obviously. This is the one I was talking about, replacing the uh, the SIL 8 package with the 9-pin uh, package. Again, no difference. It's just uh, you got to take out the 1-pin, or pin 1 as it were, and use uh, pins 2 to 9 as your 8-pin ICs. So yeah, that's been done. Now over here, there's two ways you can do this mod. You can install a socket and replace this chip with ANT4066B. I was afraid that was going to run this way over budget, so I didn't do that. What I did was I applied the relay mod here. And I used that exact relay. And you have to change R998 to a 1N4148 signal diode. That's uh, this here. And you have to pay close attention to the polarity. And you, you've got a tape heads forum post you can go to in order to see exactly what polarity to install that in. And I've done it correctly. I've tested it. It's working. Okay, what else we got here? I know there's more. Okay, these four resistors here have been changed. R61 and 62 over to 6.8K, and I've done all four of those. And I think I used metal film resistors for those because... Uh, those were the ones I didn't forget to order from DigiKey. So yeah, the stuff I did forget to order is all old stock from my uh, bucket of parts somewhere. Okay, now over here there's a headphone mod. You can replace the op amps here with uh, NJM5532S. I do have those parts. I decided not to do this mod. And you got to remove several of these resistors to do that mod, but uh, I rarely listen through headphones, so I decided not to bother. Because uh, finding these uh, op amps is kind of hard these days. They're all only available from China now on eBay, so I'm not sure if I trust those. My original part stockpile is from uh, the UK somewhere, so I'm really reluctant to use those up on a headphone mod. So I'm basically not doing that. In fact, I just ordered another set of op amps today. I I ordered NJM uh, 21, or what was it? Uh, 2114Ls or something like that from the United States. I ordered a bucket of five for something like 50 bucks. And again, that's another thing that's gone over to China only. So uh, I thought I better get those while the getting was good. Anyhow, next mod. This has been done. You add a couple of 1N4148 diodes between pins 1 and 2 and 6 and 7 to eliminate distortion. And that's going into IC551 here. That's the uh, controller for the uh, level meters. Just keeps it from messing up the signal, and I have done that mod. Maybe I'll show you later. If I can stop clicking on that. And we can scroll down here, and this is where on the board all those mods apply. So this is the recording amp mods that I have done. Applies to both head types, so you do them all. 
and you have to realign the deck after you do these resistors also. And down here is the Amorphous Playback mod. There's IC2 where the uh, new NJM5532S went in. And this is what I've replaced with the relay. Here's where that diode goes in place of the resistor. And these lines here, these are the uh, HX Pro mod. And uh, these resistors here are the ones that you change out for uh, the amorphous head, I think. Not sure. I believe so, though. Anyhow, these are the other two recording app mod resistors to change out. And then you change VR5 and VR6, or realign VR VR5 and 6, after the fact. And this manual tells you exactly how to do that. So I'm not terribly worried about uh, explaining how to do that. It's actually not that hard. It's basically the same procedure as the uh, uh, Denon DRM3, but uh, the way Technics has it, has you doing it, is kind of confusing and confounding, and uh, I'm not sure why they have you doing it that way, but we'll discuss that later when I get to that part. Anyhow, I promised I would talk about uh, oiling locations. And this is where Technics is really nice. See, down here they tell you exactly which oil to use, down in this part here. Right there. But uh, the problem is you can't really get this oil anywhere. No, I don't want to move content. Go away. This is the oil and grease they want you to use, but uh, I'm just going to do the usual Molly Coat and Anderol applications and uh, if you look real close it tells you exactly where you want where they want the uh, the parts oiled see all these little X's here that's where they want you to put the oil very nice of them so yes very convenient I will be going by this when I get around to relubing this this unit and there's X's right there you can see it tells you it wants the a style lubricant which is Floyle AK 152 but uh, yeah I'm using the uh, the Molly code on that just like every other place that's marked with a when it comes to me doing my uh, transport service I don't think I'm going to go as as in-depth as I usually do because uh, Technics is so good with the documentation here and this manual is not hard to find. It's You just do a Google search and you can find it. And yeah, here's the sea oil locations right here. Capstan bearings. I'm going to use the Anderol 456 on that. Just like I usually do. But yeah, it's real easy to follow this. And it's not the hardest uh, mechanism in the universe to... Uh, to lubricate so I'm just gonna show highlights I'm not gonna go through the whole rigmarole here otherwise it's gonna be a two-hour video and uh, you guys probably don't want to waste that much time watching one of my videos so I'll save you the time so before we get back into the transport of this particular deck I want to do it address the modifications and show you what they kind of look like but first I need to mention something about this area right here I mentioned before that uh, this transistor had uh, bad joints underneath and uh, what I found was while I was testing this unit after modification was complete I found that this thing was running burning hot so I'm not entirely thrilled about this I did look up on the I did look up the uh, data sheet on this transistor and it's supposed to be good for 150 degrees but uh, that doesn't mean I have to accept that. So uh, what I've done is I've ordered from Mauser several TO92 heat sinks, and one of them's gonna go on that transistor and probably another one's gonna go on this one here. These are responsible for the real drive on this unit. So if they fail, the real drive goes out. So I'm gonna just try and do my best to make sure they don't fail anytime soon. They're not real uncommon parts, so I should be able to get replacements if they do fail. I just don't want them to fail. And uh, also because the original capacitor that was here was uh, had scorch marks up and down the sides, 
I'm kind of thinking this let go before or something around here flamed out before and scorched that capacitor. So I was not content with leaving that capacitor in there either because uh, I just felt like it was prone to fail. So I went ahead and put in a brand new Nichicon Muse 10 microfarad 50 volt cap in there to replace the uh, 10 microfarad 16 volt that was in there before. They're both bipolar, so I had to use bipolar. And this is all I got for bipolar, so that's what that is. Now, as you can see, there's the relay for the relay mod on that particular IC. I've again tacked it down, just like in the Pioneer, with the Silicon Safe RTV. Or, not Silicon Safe, it is Silicon. Sensor Safe RTV. My brain's funny, don't mind me. But yeah, just to, to connect it, what I just did was I used a bunch of old uh, component leads. I've, I've been cutting off all these capacitors, and I just used them instead of uh, wire to solder them down. And this is how you want to solder them. These are the uh, three pins on this side. And I'll show you what's going on on the other side. Yeah, right there. You've got actually five pins connected on this side. So you skip pin seven and, uh, or not pin seven, that's pin nine. Pin nine and 12 don't have a connection. Pin 13 goes up here and over to this lead. Pin 14 comes up here to this lead. These, these are what's driving the coil. And then here's the uh, diode right here to uh, make sure that the, the uh, Coil gets the right voltage in the positive or in the right polarity. So that's about it, I think. There's the new IC number two. I did just leave one of the uh, the pin one component lead, lead bent over so I can use it for a uh, test point. So yeah, that's about it. There's the resistors here, two of them for the recording mod. I don't know if you can see them. Those two, and then these two over here. And then, oh, where are they? This big one here, this big one here. I didn't order those parts from DigiKey, so I had to dig them out of my stockpile. But uh, yeah, all the modifications are in. And I can tell you right now that the deck is performing flawlessly. In fact, it's never sounded better. So uh, let's get into the transport and finish this job, shall we? We've got a bunch more capacitors to do. All right, so the next step in our little mission here, I'll rearrange my lights so you can actually see what I'm doing, is to replace all these surface mount capacitors with something that's less likely to fail in the future. So I'm just trying to figure out exactly how I'm gonna do this. Do I want to use the twist method, the cutoff method, or just use the soldering iron? And I'm going to try to use the soldering iron, I think. I would rather do that. But let's see, what we what do we need here? 4.7 to 25, three of those, non-polarized. And 10, 10 microfarads, 16. I'm not sure, I can, I can check the schematics real quick and find out for sure, but... Uh, these 4.7s are going to be a little bit of an issue because they're right around where the flywheel goes. So I'm going to have to be careful to use something that'll fit. And I think I've got the parts to do it. So uh, let me get all the capacitors out I'm going to need and then we'll get started. So to increase my chance of success, I think I want to pull this board entirely off. If I can. Not sure if I can. We'll give it a shot, anyway. And the bearing is holding it in. I gotta pop that out real quick here. And now we can get going on this. And I have confirmed that these are 10 microfarad 16 volts, so I've got the parts for them. Now the question is, am I going to be able to do this without damage? I 
I know it's difficult to see. It's also very difficult to do it this way. There, I got one off. So I'm basically going to be doing that for the rest of them. So I'm going to go ahead and do this off camera so I'm not wasting too much of your time. And I'll be back. Well, folks, I'm about halfway or a little over halfway through the job and I screwed up. Trying to do this the right way, I ended up pulling this, this uh, trace right off the board. So there was no connection there to solder down to anymore. So I've got a couple of, well, I've got one jumper wire in there and a solder bridge. So hopefully that'll hold. I've checked the continuity. It's fine throughout the whole circuit. So I guess I'll continue on. And I think I'm going to do the cut it off method for the, the remaining two. So yeah, I guess my perfect record ends today. Usually I can do this without pulling traces off the board. But this time didn't work out. So let me keep going. So all the capacitors are done and I have gone through and I've checked them all for continuity to see if they're making good contact throughout the circuit and they appear to be. I have to say the cutoff method worked every bit as well as the twist off method, which I used on the DCC deck. So uh, I think 12 volt vids has something going on there. He was right, the, the cutoff method really does work well. So I might be doing more of that in the future, but uh, for now, I just hope that this board still works after I get it back in the in the machine after service. Because, uh, yeah, breaking that trace off the board, not a not my finest moment here. And this one also came away a little bit, but that's because I was trying to position this capacitor so it'd be out of the way. So, uh, with luck, everything should be okay now. I'm not too concerned about the height of these capacitors or this one. I should say. It should fit. I'll find out for sure. But uh, yeah, we'll keep going here. I'm going to put this back together and then we're going to probably relube this gear back here. So further updates. I should clearly not be working today because I screwed up again. This didn't hold. So basically what I had to do was uh, basically at this point both traces have ripped off the board on that one. So I had to uh, Solder in a jumper wire, again. It's kind of running down there. I don't know if you can see it. And then I had to install this capacitor way the heck over here so I could get it back to fully connected status. So it should be okay. But uh, the reason why that pulled entirely off the board was because I was a doofus and I thought I wanted to get this one screw back in. And of course, just trying to move that other capacitor just ripped everything off the board. So, wonderful. But I think I should be okay now. Let me put this back in. and Hopefully I'll have no other problems to report. So with a little capacitor debacle in the past, we're going to try and replace on this gear now. Got the new one right here. We're just going to see if it works. There's our brand new gear right there. Seems like it mates properly, so I can go ahead and pull the old one off. Press the new one on. All right, new gear is engaged. It's moving well too, so I'm gonna say that was a success on that, on that particular issue. So now we got to do some lubing here, and I'm going to put a little, another little drop of oil in that uh, capstan bearing a bit later on. But uh, first, I want to deal with this gear and re-lubing it. And to do that, I've got to get at it. We'll take the coil off for the motor and be aware that there is a shorter screw on that position right there and it looks like I'm gonna to have to fix this connector here too 
Ah, now the other side pulled out. Great. I don't like these connectors. I just don't. I'm strongly thinking about just soldering these wires in. So yeah, they've provided some solder pads here and I'm going to use them. And you probably didn't see any of that. So let me get this coil fixed and I'll be right back. Alright, I fixed up the coil. Now it's time to play what else can go wrong with this job. I should not have started doing this today. I know that now, but whatever. Okay, that's how that goes. The little hole in the gear goes to the capstan. I'm anxious to get this back together now so I can find out just how bad I screwed up on the frickin' direct drive motor here. I knew I shouldn't have started doing this today. Anybody out there making bets on how bad I screwed this up and whether or not it's actually even going to work when I get it back together? All right, that seems to be moving well. So I gotta consult the service manual and figure out how to get the real tables off. So if I'm reading the service manual right, and I'm probably not, you get the real tables out from this angle. So we'll find out. Just how terrible this is gonna be. Okay, I think I'm going to have to desolder these two solenoids now. God, I hope the motor works on this thing again after I'm done. Hate to think about how much it's going to suck if, if I did all that work bringing this back from all that shipping damage is for nothing. Not to mention all the AMT modifications that have just been applied to this thing. Well, I got it. Broke one of these stupid things off, but uh, it's still holding well enough that I... Well, maybe it's not holding well enough. Maybe I have to epoxy this back on. That's the problem. They've got these little pins on these switches that uh, break so easily that you can't help but do damage to them. So I'm going to try to get that back on without having to epoxy it back on, but I may not have a choice there. I suppose super glue might actually work too. Yeah, that's not going to stay on otherwise. So I'm going to clean that up real good, and then I'm going to super glue that switch thingamajigger back on. And no, you know what? I'm going to put everything back together and I'm going to be done with this because uh, this is just not going very well today. I wanted to get this ready to record test tapes. It was already doing really well, so why screw it up any further? All right, moving on. New pinch roller time. Normally I don't hit the abort button quite so easily with these real tables, but... Uh, I'm just having one heck of a rotten week, so I'm just not interested in pushing my luck any further. We're going to get this done, and hopefully that'll be the end of it, because I'm just done with this today. All right, I found the new pinch roller. It took me a while, because it was hiding, and that looks like the right one. I finally got me a new hammer for this kind of thing. Not sure it'll work very well, but I've got it. And I had my punch here a second ago. Not that it matters, because the arm is cracked anyway. Should be able to just press it out manually. 
Correct. I was able to do that. Yeah, so hopefully this pinch roller does the job. I am not sure it will, but it should. And I should clean up in there before I install that. Excuse my reach. Can't remember if I did it before, but I'll do it now. Little molly coat on that shaft. Feels good. So I'm hoping that means it is good because I don't want to deal with this any longer than I have to. So hopefully everything works. I verified that the that all the traces were making contact on the uh, direct drive board, so it should work. Whether or not it actually will, well, no idea. But I just have to be done with this now. It's just been too hard of a week for me. Really shouldn't have started doing this in the first place, but I did. Anyhow, that's going to be it. I'm going to get it back together and we'll test it out and see if it works. If it does work, we'll go for the, from there. If it doesn't work, we'll go from there. All right, let's see how bad I screwed up. Power on. Is the capstan motor doing anything? It sure is. Might have got off lucky. Let's see if it'll play a tape. I ended up taking apart the uh, power loading mechanism for the door as well and regreasing it. I did that all off camera. I hope you guys don't mind. It's been a bad enough day. I didn't want to put that on the, the video yet. And it's playing. Good. Yeah, I was having a little trouble with the door not opening right away after uh, sitting for a while. So I figured it's best to go in there and lube, lube up the, uh, the power loading mechanism. So I did that. But uh, yeah, now that it's working, and we know it's working, and I'm not getting back in there anytime soon, I'll tell you that right now. It is time to do the uh, calibration on the record amplifier, and then we can do the record playback test. How does that sound? I gotta shut this off for today, though. I'm coming back to this tomorrow to do that. So, picking up again with the Technix RSB755. I decided to go ahead and do the alignment off-camera for the record levels, because uh, yesterday went so crappy for me with when it comes to uh, servicing this unit, but uh, I got it lined up, and I thought I would just talk you through how I did the alignment on camera, just so I can explain to you how this went, and uh, what I did, and what to do, and such. And you'll have to forgive me, because I'm feeling extremely sick today. Obviously coming down with something, as if this week wasn't bad enough, what with uh, a death in the family, and... Uh, all that garbage going on with that DCC deck, which I somehow decided was a good idea to start working on in the same week. But whatever. Okay, so let's talk about how Technix wants this alignment done. I've got the printout here. Measurement and alignment, or er, measurement and adjustment methodis. Measurement condition. This is what they want you to set the deck up. Four, before you get started. Record level control, maximum. Timer, off. MPX, off. Bias adjustment, v VR, that, that's this thing here, center. Record balance control, center, that's this one here. And I'm leaving, or I left these also at center. 
they don't spe specify what to do with these controls, but uh, it, you sometimes, well, actually they do right here. Record calibration, center, NR, off, heads are clean, capstan and pressure rollers clean, judgeable room temperature, 20 degrees plus or minus five degrees. And uh, they want an attenuator, DC voltmeter, resistor, 600 ohms. I didn't have that, so I did it without. I don't think you need it for record levels. They want you to get an electronic voltmeter, if I can talk, oscilloscope, frequency counter, and AF oscillator. Basically, I've got all of that in that machine right there. That's why I bought that scope. It's got a built-in signal generator. And through the measurement functionality of the scope, I don't need a voltmeter at all. In fact, using a voltmeter on these specific alignments is asking for trouble because it will throw off the circuit. Anyhow, it tells you where the, the adjustment points are. This is the one we're concerned with today. Overall gain, VR5 and 6, that is right there. So, it really helps to figure out exactly what the manufacturer is actually looking for when you do these adjustments because sometimes you can find shortcuts. And in this case, <clears throat> here's the adjustment here. Basically, this adjustment procedure is laid out for all of Technic's decks, including the two-head models. So this is how you do it with a two-head machine. The shortcut in this machine happens to be that it has off-tape monitoring. So we don't actually have to do all of these steps in the way Technics wants you to do them. So basically, reading between the lines here, what they want is for the same signal that goes into the recording amplifier to be the same level as what's coming out of the record amplifier. So what they want you to do is apply a reference input signal, 1 kilohertz, minus 24 decibels, <coughs> excuse me, and then they want you to attenuate the output so that its level becomes 0 0.4 volts. So here's what I did. I put 0 0.4 volts at 1 kilohertz into both line inputs. And then what I did was I dialed this back from full, from full gallop all the way down to uh, where I got 0 0.4 volts on the scope in the source position. That would be this one right here. And you can hear that relay clicking away in there. That's how I know that works. Anyhow, after I got that set up, what I did was, actually I'm gonna show you in real time. I started the, uh, the voltage uh, or the signal generator and we'll go into source here. And it should read out. Um, actually it was already running. Why am I not getting anything now? Okay, there we go, now it's moving. As you can see, we've got our one kilohertz at about 400 millivolts, which is exactly what the procedure wanted. And uh, after doing that, we come down here, we go into tape mode, record pause, we go into the tape section and we hit Play to start recording, and then it'll give us the signal. Right there. Then we come back up here and we make sure that this is running at 400 millivolts. And if it's not, we adjust VR5 and 6 until it does. And then just to double check, we can go between source and monitor here. And the level should be exactly the same. So this unit is aligned now. Now, because I've already done this off camera, I'm gonna do something with you on camera. We're gonna check the, uh, the wow and flutter in a different way than I did in the first video on this machine. Basically, we're going to remove the uh, test tape I used entirely from the equation and uh, whatever deck was recording that test tape. 
we need to find out what this does on its own merits in order for it to be able to do its own test tapes. So what I'm going to do now with you guys on camera is I'm going to put three kilohertz from there into here and then we're going to test the wound flutter in real time because we have off tape monitoring. Basically what we're going to start doing is recording a test tape in real time and then monitoring the wound flutter as the uh, signal comes back out of the machine. Now I gotta caution you, just because this is quartz lock does not mean it's going to be absolutely dead on target for 3 kilohertz. Remember it was running fast before, and I'm presuming it's going to run fast now. But uh, this is just to find out exactly how fast it's running, what uh, frequency I have to actually run it at in order to get the perfect 3 kilohertz out of it onto the tape. And uh, yeah, just see how well the wild and flutter is doing after my services. Remember, the real tables have not been done yet, and uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure I want to do them now, but uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what I'm dealing with for uh, for the real tables. I'll have to figure that out at some point, but uh, for now, this unit is running well enough that it's not really that much of an issue. Okay, my... Uh, Signal generator is running now at 3 kilohertz, and I'm going to hit record, and we're just going to see what's going on here. Oh, look at this! It actually is dead on target. Interesting. Very interesting, actually. You'll remember that the... Uh, the test tape I have, actually let me grab it here for a second while you guys watch. Yeah, the test tape was from Fix Your Audio, and the recording deck was a Sony TCK555 ESJ. That is a quartz lock machine, dual capstan. So it's interesting to me that this deck is holding the perfect 3 kilohertz signal better than apparently that one is. But uh, I'm a little bit disappointed right now as to the wow and flutter results I'm getting. 0 0.05, I would have thought this machine would do better than that, or I would have hoped it would do better than that. It's doing all right, don't get me wrong, but uh, I was hoping it would do better. Let me change the range here. Oh yeah, maybe it's getting down there yet. We do have to watch it for a while, just to be sure. But yeah, look at that frequency. It's just dead on target. So whatever worries I had about the, my capacitor job messing up, I guess I didn't have to worry about that. It's doing fine. Remember, this is real time coming directly from the signal generator at three kilohertz, going through the deck and into the wow and flutter readings from the tape monitor. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't get more real-time than this, so I might be doing this a lot more often for future cassette decks, especially the quartz lock direct drive ones. You'll remember I've got two incoming from Japan right now that have quartz lock direct drive and dual capstan, so... Yeah, I'm excited to see what those do using this method now. But, uh, yeah, in terms of this thing making uh, speed calibration tapes, I think it's good enough. 0 0.05, 0 0.04, it's fine. This will make decent enough uh, test tapes for uh, most of the stuff I work on, like the two headers and such. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. I'm hoping to find one that can do 0 0.02 or something like that, but uh, clearly this one's not going to be able to, to pull in those numbers, but uh, that's fine. It doesn't have to. But uh, yeah, doing fine. I'm very pleased with these results. So, I gotta mention real quick before we continue, some of these transistors stay on all the time when this is plugged in, including that one that down there that gets burning hot. So uh, this is probably not going to spend a lot of time with the uh, full-time power applied to it. It's just... Uh, I don't want to burn up that transistor, especially before I've got the heat sinks to put on it. So, 
Yeah, I can't wait to find out exactly how it sounds for uh, for audio recording, but uh, we're going to find that out shortly. And I'm just going to keep this running while I show you what I'm planning on for uh, test tracks this time. I've decided to go all soundtracky, using one of the best soundtracks of all time, if you ask me. Michael Kamen was way on his game with this one. And I also got to say, if you'll mind me pontificating a little bit, that uh, this is probably the best Q sound encoded release of the early 90s, period. It's not all Madonna whispering in your ears like the Immaculate, Con Immaculate Collection. They didn't go all full surround sound on everything like that. On this recording, it's uh, more of an enhancement, not a gimmick. It's just to add uh, depth to the soundstage, and it's really well done on this release. So, yeah, I'm going to try a couple of tracks from this. I don't know if it'll work. And what am I going to try them on? Well, you guys have never seen this cassette before. I'm going to try this. Yes, folks, I have a Sony Metal Master. This is the one with the... Uh, ceramic shell on it. I only have one of these. They were expensive new back in the early 90s, and they are extremely expensive now, if you can even find them. They're like 200 bucks a tape now. So uh, I tend not to trust this in just anything, but uh, I think I'll trust this machine with it. After all, I did put this through the RCA MTR-118 once. So yeah, and you can see exactly what I had uh, recorded on here originally. I basically used my uh, Panasonic RX DS20 to record on this, and obviously it didn't work because that thing had no metal uh, metal equalization for, for that type of tape, so couldn't do that. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what it does. And uh, one other thing before I get to the recording and playback test, I'm still not sure all these switches work. This one had a problem when I first fired up the machine again. A little bit of the super glue got stuck on the bottom leaf and it wouldn't go into record mode. So I kind of twisted it back and forth and freed it up. But uh, these three over here have not been done except for Deoxit D100. So I don't know if those will hold up or not. We'll find out the hard way, I guess, if they don't. Anyhow, yeah, the uh, wound flutter test is running well using this method. Still not seeing anywhere below 0 0.46 or so, but that's fine. I'm happy with this deck as is. Considering it's been sitting here for months, it's fine.
Final thoughts about the RSB 755 after modification and after repair and after shipping damage. Well, I want to preface this by uh, saying this is the first time I've used the Sony Metal Master in any recording on any of the decks on my channel, so might be coloring my opinion somewhat because I didn't use the uh, Metal SRs this time. And also you have to keep in mind that... Uh, this is my favorite soundtrack of all time from my favorite movie of all time. So uh, there's kind of an emotional attachment there, too. I've seen that movie about 40 times now, at least. And I'll probably see it again in a couple of weeks at some point. But uh, I digress. Where does this one fit in the pecking order? Well, that's kind of hard. Honestly, it's still clipping a little bit too easily for my liking on metal tapes. I don't think it's quite able to saturate the tape the way I had hoped it would be able to after the modifications. However, this is way up there in terms of sound quality in my collection. 
Now, I apologize for using Dolby C in the in the capture, but uh, I just felt like it was the right choice with the orchestral uh, first track in here. But uh, take it from me, this thing sounds even better without Dolby C on it. So uh, where do I put it in the, in the pecking order of my best recorders? Well, I'm still kind of having trouble with that one because, uh, honestly, I kind of want to put it at number two behind the... Uh, TAC V900X. I think it's a little better than the Excelia XK007, if you ask me. However, the 007 can fully saturate a metal tape. This can't. And I suspect it wouldn't be able to until I uh, replace the head with that head modification. But uh, I'm not going to do that because this is comfortably under budget. I'm right around 200 bucks into this thing. And, uh, Considering it got here with shipping damage and all that stuff, I really can't fault it for being as good as it is. And uh, it deserves some credit as well for being Quartz Lock Direct Drive. It's the best performing tape deck I own in terms of wound flutter and speed stability. It still is. I got uh, wound flutter as low as 0.32%, or 0.032%, sorry while I was uh, recording my first speed calibration tape. And yeah, I did let this tape go through all the way to the end. It's got a full speed calibration done on it now. I wrote 0.036% on it, but uh, I saw 0 0.032 af after that. So. so if you're having a hard time with one of these things and things aren't going your way, it's it's usually best to step away for a few days and then come back to it later. I'm not going to fiddle around with the editing in this video. I'm going to leave it as is with the uh, record and play test sort of somewhere in the middle now, but uh, I figured out how to get the real tables apart. I'm going to tell you that now because some of y'all might need to know that. <clears throat> Basically everything is friction fit together. I'm going to use the, uh, the take up side to illustrate here. If I can, these are the various components. This is the section that goes, if I can pan down on here, this goes down on there. And then this section goes in underneath from the bottom, underneath there. It's got the little reflective thing, reflective doohickeys on it for the uh, for the uh, sensors and then yeah this piece friction fits onto this piece if that makes any sense at all it's really tight it's going to act like it wants to break but use a screwdriver or something and just pry on it and it won't break at least i hope it doesn't break for you because it almost broke for me and that would have been bad anyhow try to keep these springs separate this is the one that goes on top it just goes on there like that. And then you've got this little piece that goes on top of there like that. And then this piece is friction fit on the top of everything else like that. So that's how that works. That's how I'm going to sort of keep that separate in my mind. Now, when it comes to back tension, this is the supply side here. And... Uh, this spring provides the back tension, I think. Not sure. So uh, I'm going to clean all this up now and hopefully get this to run better for a while and flutter. But uh, I did find an issue. In fact, I shot several segments on that issue that uh, I'm probably going to edit out now. But uh, on the brakes here, there's this oblong... Or rather, it's not supposed to be oblong. It's this roller thing here. This is the brakes for the reels. And this has got a, an oblong hole worn into it. So I'm not exactly sure if it does anything much for back tension at all. But this could be causing part of our issue. But uh, I think the bulk of the issue is all grease and lube and whatnot. And now I'm going to get to be able to uh, service these now. So... I'm probably going to do this off camera because 
I don't really want to film anymore on this machine, but uh, I'll get this done. And Yeah, just consult the service manual if you want to know exactly where to lubricate. Like, I know for sure the outside of these has to be lubricated, but uh, it, it tells you right in the service manual where they want all the lube, so just go by that if you're dealing with one of these. Well, it's back together and we're going to see what we got. I ended up having an extra screw. I don't know where it came from. I don't think it came from this deck. I think it just was on the table here and it kind of got stuck to the rotor before I put it back together last time. Anyhow, it doesn't look like any of the screws that go to this deck, so I'm not going to worry about it. It's powered up right now. And we're just going to use the uh, Fix Your Audio Speed Test tape because I don't want to deal with the scope right now and the signal generator and all that stuff. So... We are rolling. How good is it now? Maybe I should start the uh, capture. Not a lot different, I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, this is probably about the best this machine's ever going to get. Maybe if I could find a better pinch roller arm. Maybe the new Molly Code will break in yet. I don't know. Maybe there's too much take up tension or something like that, but I didn't really see any way to adjust that on this machine. Oh, it's settling down a little bit here. I don't know, maybe it's better with the old pinch roller too. Anyway, I'm going to call it quits right here. I'm happy with this. I've done pretty much all I can with this. And I'm noticing there's a little bit of a channel imbalance now, so... Well, maybe not. I can check that again at some point. Not this point. It is settling in a little bit. Clearly this machine is very high hours and uh, is probably never going to be all that great again. But it suits what I need it for. We saw that at 3 kilohertz, it's dead on target, and I mean completely 100% on 3 kilohertz. So that's useful to me, and it sounds magnificent, so that's fine. Now, for those of you who are patient enough to stick around for this long, I'm going to give you a special preview as to the first of the Japanese ones that came in. I'm still waiting for the second one. This is actually the middle of the range when it comes to the expensive ones. Or for expense, I mean. Don't mind me, I can't talk again. Anyhow, we'll come over here. Still got to get the capacitors into the TIAC V900X. I've got them. I've just been lazy. But immediately above that, we have... An AND GXZ9100. This is the top of the line. And if you're wondering what the AND stands for, it's Akai and Diatone. Diatone was uh, Mitsubishi's or Mr. Squishy's high end brand back in the day. It might still be a high end brand for them today, but uh, basically, this is mostly an Akai machine. It, Mitsubishi really didn't have much input in this. Basically what happened was Mitsubishi kind of bankrolled the uh, the A&D endeavor and in return Akai put their their initial on the front panel here so that's what that is. Anyway, this is the first Akai bit of home audio gear I've had in decades. I used to have one of their speakers back in the 80s and that's the only other Akai 
piece of gear I've ever had. So I decided if I wanted to to figure out whether or not Akai was worth getting into for cassette decks, I thought maybe I'd just go for the top of the line model first. And there's uh there's actually three of these with this uh model number. There's the 9100 which I have, then there's the EX and then the EV and the EV is the is the desirable one. But uh yeah, this one cost me a bit. Actually, it cost me a lot, but it's actually cheaper than the uh than the next one that's coming in, hopefully. And it's uh more expensive than the third one that's coming in, if that makes any sense. Anyhow, enough about that. We'll get into this as time goes by. I don't have time to get to it right now. I think this guy is going to be coming up real soon, but uh, that's if you haven't seen it already. Anyhow, that's going to be it for today, guys. I'll see you next time. Take care.